I reckon we can start now. So welcome everyone. Uh, this was a very quick last minute uh, virtual club meeting to be organised and uh, but I'm very grateful. Peter Hill put up his hand. There were a couple of people who put up their hands so thank you to everyone that offered. Uh, Peter Hill though is, is, is who will be uh, our guest speaker tonight and he has some very interesting uh, stories to tell, I'm sure, from the research that he's done on a very interesting character from the 60s, 70s, and uh, I'll leave the rest for Peter to explain. But um, many of you would probably know Peter from uh, being a very active member of the club and certainly has also assisted us with a few of these virtual club meetings in the right. past. A couple of people coming in with out mute. I'll just get you sorted out. Yep. So the um, uh, so thank you, sir. I'm just going to let in a couple more people that have arrived late. Just give me one moment. So just if you've just joined, if you wouldn't mind muting yourself, otherwise I'll get to it as soon as I can. Awesome. All right, so as I was saying, uh, Peter Hill is, is, is our guest tonight. And he's going to be talking about Fred Opert. Now, for, for those that don't know, um, Peter has, is a writer, uh, has certainly written this book and has had it published, and, uh, but is a blogger as well. So you may already know some of the uh, uh, contributions that he makes to us on a regular basis, especially through the magazine, which we're very grateful for. So without uh, wasting any more time, I'm going to pass over to Peter. And uh, Peter, are you there? I'm going to make you host. Thank you. Am I now the host? Well, just about. I'm just... Uh... Give me one sec. Okay, over to you, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vicky. Um, like you say, it was all a bit, bit last minute, but we're here. <laughs> um, I've just shared a sc screen, which I hope you can all see, which is the a picture of the front cover of the book, um, just so you know who we're talking about, and I'll expand on that a little in a minute. Um, Fred Opert is the main guy in these photos with the balding head with KK Rosberg on the left little picture and with James Hunt on the right. Um, and he's he is, as you can see, obviously, um, he's the subject of this particular book. So, the first question is, why on earth would you write about this bloke? Because very few people in Australia know who he is. It was one of the few places that Fred had his team race. Um, but I'd met him in New Zealand in the 70s when I lived there and um, was very surprised. Let me go back a tick. So in the 70s, I met him when he bought KK Rosberg and a guy called Kazarowitzki over to New Zealand. He'd, the previous year he'd bought Brian Redman and the year after he bought Rosberg back to defend his title with his teammate that year being um, Bobby Rahal. So fast forward to 2017 and um, what happened was I was writing a blog about a Chevron, Formula Atlantic Chevron that a friend of mine had just bought 
And it turned out that it was a car that Fred Opert had imported into America um, way back when. And then in doing a bit of research, I found out that Opert had actually died one year earlier, August 2016. And I went looking for more information and there was very little written about the guy, which was a great surprise because he, amongst other things, had 20 future Formula One drivers drive for him during the time that he was running his race teams. So I made more inquiries and decided that it might be worthwhile writing a book about this guy because he fascinated me. He was a real character. Um, and I started then doing some research. Um, he and his teams had raced pretty well everywhere except Australia. So <laughs> here I was in Australia writing about Fred Opert. The first thing I did was I emailed a friend of mine in New Zealand, an ex-race driver and um, somebody who knows a lot of people. And before I even got his response, I was getting responses from people that he had forwarded my email to. And the email said, look, this Fred Albert died and this guy is thinking of writing a book about him. So I was finding that mechanics, because he employed a lot of Australians and a lot of Kiwis, the mechanics who worked for him were sending me emails about him, which was um, a good start. And then I tracked down his sister, which I was pretty pleased with because she wasn't called Opert, um, in America, in Boston. And um, she and her husband, very, very nice people and very accommodating, said, yeah, we, we think it'd be a good idea because there isn't anything previously written. And so I started work on that and started my research. And um, it was from there really that I spent the next two years working on the book and got to talk to all sorts of interesting people. Um, and it was from the day I started to the time that the book was printed was just over two and a half years, which is about normal, I think probably, for, for to put together a book. My difficulty was that I was based in Australia and most of the people he dealt with were in other countries. So I was relying on contacting people by email, finding them on Facebook, finding them on you know, the other social media. One contact would lead me to two more contacts and so it went on. Um, the interesting thing, as I said earlier, was that Fred had, had during his life, on well, the early part of his life, I guess, when he was running his race teams, he'd had 20 guys go through his team that went on to race in Formula One. Um, Alain Prost, Alan, Alan Jones, Keke Rosberg, obviously, and Bobby Rahal was briefly in Formula One, and it just kept rolling. Um, some of you might know he of Hector Rabaki, who raced a Lotus for a long time in Formula One. Um, uh, Brian Redman, people that a lot of these old blokes I can see on the screen would, would recognize <laughs> their names. Um, so I started to track down these people and I thought to myself that it was probably going to be very difficult because they're busy people and they're famous people. Um, but as soon as I mentioned that I was writing about Fred Opert, most of the doors opened very quickly. And um, so that was, that was useful. And I did most of my, res most of my um, interviews just via Skype. People agreed to a Skype interview. I'd take notes and I'd record it. And, and we worked from there. And my next problem was, before I tell you a little bit more about the bloke, my next problem was that I'm here in Australia. It's no good me self-publishing because I won't be able to market the thing. He's not known here. And so I went looking for a um, publisher. And I was particularly lucky that I found a publisher in the UK quite quickly, Veloce, which is a, a well-known publisher there. They were very keen to do the story. And so it all came together quite quickly. But just before a little bit of background on the guy himself, um, he, all this, originally he was studying law. His brother's an attorney. I had to be careful what I did because he could have got sued. Um, and he, when he was studying law, he was also doing a bit of motor racing and he had a Jaguar XK 150S. And 
he got booked at some incredible speed in New York and um, promptly stuck the ticket in his pocket, I think, and forgot about it. And then when he went back to university, the cops were waiting for him and they took him off and he ended up in court. So here's this budding lawyer ending up in court. And the judge said to him that um, he, you know, he'd done the wrong thing and it was a very serious offence. And he would um, fine him, I think it was $500, which was a hell of a lot of money then, plus five. And Fred thought, oh, that's all right, so I'll go off and pay the $505. But he found out the plus five was five days in jail. So here he was landed in jail with all sorts of undesirables. And I suspect that because he had a criminal offence, that might have impacted on whether he could continue as a lawyer. But be, it may or may not be right, but it doesn't matter because he had decided then that he wanted to, to make a life in motorsport. He was already doing some racing. He was a bit of a character wheeler dealer. And so when he came out of jail, he never went on to continue his um, studies in, in, in law. And he started working for Carl Haas, which a lot, who I'm sure a lot of you will have heard of Carl Haas. He was an agent for Carl Haas and he was importing British sports cars and um, selling speed parts and all sorts of things. And he wheeled and dealed until he eventually started to import race cars. And in those days, there was very little circuit racing in America, the sort we know with single seaters. So Fred, was primarily responsible for establishing the availability of single seater race cars that he imported from England and establishing a fields big enough to race in, in North America, the US and Canada. And um, he became the agent for Brabham. That was his first agency. Later he became the agent for Chevron, um, but he was the agent also for a whole lot of other makes. And he, he as I said, was a wheeler dealer, knew how to put things together. And he was quickly established himself as the biggest uh, dealer of race cars in America um, at that stage. Um, so they'd get, they'd get the English Autosport or whatever it was, and then they'd buy cars over the phone and have them shipped to America. And he'd bribe the longshoremen as I think they were called in those days and and get get them quickly released and have them for sale in no time. Um, then he started he was racing all the time he raced Brabham and in fact he wasn't a bad driver he won a couple of championships but the business grew and grew and he was also starting to run cars for other people and this is where the Kiwis and the Aussies come into the because he found that Kiwis and Aussies were the best mechanics. Um, they didn't go home at five o'clock and, and they were able to improvise. So he started to have paying drivers and he'd run cars for the paying drivers. And there were a lot of people rich enough to, to do that. They would buy a Chevron or a Brabham from him. He would do the preparation, not him personally, but his team, turn up at the racetrack. All they had to do was flying and race the car and he could make money as he did it. So he was selling the cars, making money. He was running the cars for them and making money. And he didn't just run one team. He, his operation at one stage was running in four different categories. So he'd have one group out running Formula Atlantic, another at a Super V meeting, another at a Formula Ford meeting. Um, and, and he was running a Formula Two team in the UK. So, he had a lot happening. He also created the first motor racing driver school, um, the Fred Opert Racing uh, School in America. So he, he had balls in the air all the time. And on top of that, he, he was a real character, as you can see in some of these photos that uh, I showed you the front, and I'll show you a couple more soon. He always had this huge smile on his face. You hardly ever saw Fred with, with anything but this big smile. He had a great time all the time. 
he probably couldn't do it anymore. Political correctness didn't exist. He loved the women and he loved the motor racing. And um, he, it, it seemed wherever they went, they had a very good time. Peter? Uh, yeah. Can I just interrupt you just for one sec? And um, uh, I'm, I'm sure I've got a few questions. And by the way, everyone will get an opportunity to ask a few questions. Um, Peter, what I would like for you for the moment is to, unless you're ready to uh, show some pictures, I was just hoping you could give me the hosting back just so I can facilitate a couple of people to join in and then I'll give it back to you if you like. Sure, I remember how to do that. Hang on a second, here we go. You're, you're very welcome to continue with that. Um, hope I didn't disrupt your thinking there. Thinking? What's thinking? Well. <laughs> Here you go. You're about to make you the host. There you are. Okay. When I get that hosting back, I will show you a couple of photos. But the, um, I, I guess the picture I'm painting is of this very dynamic guy. He didn't sleep much. He didn't drink, not for any particular reason of um, religion or whatever. He had something he found time. Um, so he he seemed to have boundless energy. He he fancied himself with the ladies, and yet in most of the photos you'll see he had a tendency to put on weight, and he lost his hair when he was about thirty years old. But it didn't seem to stop him. And I guess. Peter, are you still with us? Thank you. <laughs> you Sorry me. about that. Something <laughs> happened. Somehow you got caught up in the muting. Now you're going to back to the host again. Uh, yep, you're, you're, hang on, this damn screen keeps flicking me out, so just one sec, you're with me and then you're suddenly gone. Oh, here we go. All right, so you're back to being host, Peter. Thank you. Let me share a photo with you, we just make it a bit more interesting than me talking the whole time. Hopefully, oh, no, the host is attending screen sharing there you go can you see can you see that picture vicky no sorry i reckon i reckon the hosting has gone to the wrong person <laughs> i really mucked that one up peter mcconnell i reckon you've got the hosting no, i hope not <laughs> you have <laughs> while you guys sort that out i'll keep going <laughs> Peter, just, just while Peter Hill is you continuing, could you um, return the hosting, please? You yeah. better tell him what to do. He clicks on the host, he clicks on you, and that option will appear. I click on Peter Hill. No, you, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, can. Click on me, and it should, it should give you an option to make me the host. Uh, I can mute myself or mute, mute you there. What about more? Is there a more I button? host. That's it. Change host. Excellent. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So now what I should be able to do is share this with you. Um, so you should now be able to see a picture of Fred Oakley. Yep. Well yep. done. So you can see Fred's got this huge smile on his face and that just about every photo I've got of him that's what he is. And here he's with Alan Jones, who drove for him in, uh, in the US and in Germany. And James Hunt, who actually did almost drove for him. Um, what happened was after James Hunt was world champion, Fred talked him into flying over to Mexico for a Formula Atlantic race. And Hunt thought that was a great idea. And he flew over and settled himself in his hotel room with a couple of Mexican hostesses and they had to 
the poor old Marlborough lady who was who was organizing all this had to go and drag him out each day for practice. But then Bernie Eccleston found out about this and he did not like the idea of his world champion being over in Mexico driving a Formula Atlantic in the middle of the Formula One season. So he, he did a bit, got one of his um, people to do a bit of investigation and found out that they didn't have, Mexico didn't have the right license to have a Formula One driver there. So he contacted Fred Opert and said, you can have my Formula One champion drive for you, but you might tell him that he won't race for the rest of the year. So Fred had to do a bit of scurrying around and he got hold of um, James Hunt in Mexico and gave him the bad news. And James didn't seem at all worried because he had these two lovelies in his, in his um, hotel room already. And he just had more time with them. And then Fred, rang, um, uh, he got another driver anyway, it would have probably, it was Bobby Rahal, that's right, and got him to fly down and take James place. But James stayed there until he's the end of the weekend and then flew back to England. But, but this is the sort of character that Fred was, that he did know everybody. And, um, and consequently, he, he'd just make phone calls. He knew, he knew um, Bernie Eccleston and Ron Dennis and all these people. And that's why I couldn't understand why nothing had been written about him because he was such a character and, and had such a big impact on motorsport during that time. <clears throat> okay. Now, I don't know if um, people have got questions or perhaps I could tell you one more story. Um, I'll share something else with you. Um, not that, I don't want you to see that yet. Um, I had a problem getting hold of KK Rosberg because KK became Fred's protege. Most people, um, pretty well, I think everybody except KK, pretty well paid for their drives. Um, and although I had a an introduction to KK, and although I had his email address, and he would respond very briefly. He wasn't making it easy for him, for me to speak with him. The family, Fred Opert's family had given me the introduction. Anyway, I was getting a bit frustrated, but one day I was doing a bit of research in, in motorsport magazines archives. And when I searched on Rosberg, the first thing that came up was this letter you should now be able to see on the screen. Um, I hope it's there, which I'd written to motorsport back in 82 before he won his world championship suggesting that Dennis Jenkinson was wrong not something I'd take on very often and that KK Rosberg would one bare day be Formula One champion. So I sent this off to Rosberg saying I, I don't know if this makes any difference but it might give you a smile and I got this response back from him. Can you see this? Can you, Vicky, can you confirm that you can still see my screen? Yes, that's right. So KK came back and said, read your little column, funny. I'm back home now, or oh, we live back, back since yesterday, very finished. Um, and before I know it, I, I had an interview with the guy as a result of that. So it was just a bit of luck, really, that I happened to have written a letter about him to Motorsport Magazine. Okay, probably enough of me talking. Um, would you like to take questions? Vicky, do you want to, me to hand you back the host or? Um, well, I think it may be possible for people to unmute themselves. So I guess it's really then just a matter of uh, just politely, if you have a question, um, if you could unmute yourself, uh, look for an appropriate opportunity to ask your question and uh, we'll try to manage it carefully from there. If you don't, if you're not actually in the conversation, I'd appreciate if you mute in the, in the interim. Thank you. Did um, Opet have a business on the side or was he entirely involved in motorsport? 
his business was motorsport. He made money out of running race cars for people, out of selling race cars to people. Um, that's how he made his money. And, and Rosberg was probably the only guy that didn't pay. If, if you were a paying driver, he would organize everything for you. Or if you were a, um, uh, a, a, um, an organizer of an event, you might call Opert and ask him to send people to your race event. And he, he may put together sponsorship as well. So when he was running in Canada at um, Trois-Rivières, Jetan was the sponsor, the cigarette people. And so they were paying the money. And then Fred got Alan Jones or whoever, it was Alan Jones actually, and then a whole group of um, French drivers, Javouille and so on. He, he could put them in the cars without asking them for money because Jetan had paid the money. So it was always a business for Fred, except in the case of KK. Fantastic. So um, he was smart enough not to get involved with Lotus. <laughs> oh, he, he, he sold second-hand Lotuses quite a lot. <laughs> um, no, he, his, his primary, um, the, main, the main imports he had were Brabham originally, and then Chevron, Chevron and the two side by side, which was a bit of a problem for a while. And then, um, I don't know if you've heard, probably people haven't heard of Tui, which is Alan McCall's car, a Kiwi, a very successful car in Super V. And he was the agent for them. Um, but he was the agent for a number of other, but never Lotus, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna ask the obvious question. How do we buy your book and make sure that um, you get the profits rather than some reseller? Well, you. I've only got one copy left, I'm pleased to say. Um, <laughs> at the end, I'll put up a, um, um, a link. Motor Book World in Ringwood have got a few. David at Motor Book World. And Veloce the, in the UK, the um, publisher, they've got, they should have some left. And Amazon. Thank, okay. you. Thank you for the plug, Richard. Appreciate it. Uh, no, it's great. You've done a lot as editor for the club magazine for a hundred years. And uh, yeah, just, I, I, I think it's fantastic that you've um, committed yourself to writing a book and uh, enjoyed it. I want to support. So uh, yeah, let's all get out there and buy the book. <laughs> I just tell you a funny story while we're in between questions. Um, Fred always had second-hand race cars and things in the place. He, he stocked a lot of cars. And he, he had a lady working for him who was by herself one day there. And this young bloke walked in and he said he wanted a Lola um, uh, sports car that was there, uh, T70. And she thought, oh, yeah, OK. And anyway, he said, no, no, he's serious. And this is what he wanted. and. He put a deposit down in cash, which was quite unusual. And then he told her what he wanted done to the car. And then he, so when he came back, he paid the balance in cash, which was not an insignificant amount. So the Lola was taken away. And a couple of weeks later, two guys in suits turned up and um, said they were from the CIA. <laughs> and the guy who'd paid cash had robbed a bank to buy his Lola T70. <laughs> And, and this poor lady had to go, she didn't want to go to, to court, but she had to go to court. And they said, well, if, if you don't turn up, we'll come and get you. So you might as well turn up. And um, I don't know, I think they got the car back and they had to hand the money back. But, um, but the guy literally robbed a bank to buy his Lola. <laughs> One of the better stories. Peter? Any other questions? Peter, Lee, Lee Dixon. Lee, yeah. hi. Hi. Um, next time you're talking to KK, you may want to let him know that there is actually a, a town in Western Victoria named after him. Ah, okay. The uh, story is this. The first um, Adelaide Grand Prix, mate and I were dri driving over to Adelaide. It's, it's, a, it's a place somewhere near the, near the Victorian border. Yeah. It's a place called Kaikai, K-I-K-I. -I, and some wag earlier that day with a spray can, it changed the I's into E, so it became KK. Just a bit of trivia. 
Well, it's quite interesting you say that because a couple of weeks ago, I found out that where Bay Park Raceway used to be in New Zealand at Tauranga, um, there is now a subdivision and the streets are all the names of race drivers and there's a, there's a Rosberg Street. Mm. And I sent, sent him the email showing him the, the map with his name on it. <laughs> are there other questions? Peter, I've got one for you. Uh, so I guess for those of us that don't understand as much about that era of, uh, you know, the racing drivers actually, I, I, I get it. I get it to some degree, but I'd like a little bit more insight into why drivers were prepared to go through what made Fred in this situation where he could make a business of charging for the up and coming racing drivers that obviously were very talented and went on to Formula One. Uh, there was a mixture there. It's a good question. Thank you, Vicky. There, there's definitely a mixture. There were those who were never going to be Formula One, but had a lot of money and they were good drivers too. Um, um, so they, they tended to be the ones that were willing to pay, turn up at the track and race and not have to worry about it. And they, they didn't really have aspirations to be F1 drivers. They were having a good time um, and they could afford to do it. Um, a couple of the guys I talked to and then looked up, I mean, we're talking very, very rich people in families in America that uh, owned uh, incredible amounts of real estate or whatever it was. One of the mechanics one day, a, 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 an Aussie guy, said to Fred, how can this kid afford to do that? And Fred said to him, he has trouble spending the interest. <laughs> and that, that kind of summed that up where the guy was at that time. So you had those and then you had you had the other genuine drivers like KK, like Prost, like Alan Jones, um, who perhaps they wouldn't pay him to run the car, but he would have sponsorship to run them. So he was very close to a guy who sadly died quite recently I don't know if anybody would know him, it, it, they should, he was an Aussie called John Hogan. And, and John, John was Mr. Marlborough. Um, he spent Marlborough's money in motorsport. He was totally responsible for that. And Fred was very close to John. And um, I was lucky enough to interview him for this book and very sad to see that he died a couple of months back. Um, and, and so John Hogan would put together a deal to, to run a car at a meeting with, say, Alain Prost in it. Or there was a, a Swedish driver called Eja Elge, who was very, became a very close friend of Fred's and was very helpful to me. And Eja had Marlborough sponsorship. So the money was coming either from the people themselves, if they were rich enough, or from sponsors. Fred wasn't putting his hand in his pocket until KK came along. And he just, something about KK, he knew that there was enormous talent there and he was willing, he was willing to stick his neck out and take a risk and went into Formula Two in Europe primarily to, um, to give KK a leg up, yeah. And did, did that sort of, uh, was that also partly timing as well in terms of, you know, the, the evolution of F1 in particular and how that, that, sponsorship and professionalism was was happening or transforming yeah. um it was and he was he was very aware of um the possibilities you know and the you you had people um coming into the sport at that stage who were who were aware of the sponsorships who were aware of the commercialization of the sport um so you, you had Bernie Eccleston and you and um, you had Ron Dennis and these people. Um, and Fr Fred, for example, he was the first person that got the FIA or whoever it was at the time 
He said, this is madness. We turn up and we paint a number on our car at each track. It's stupid. You know, we should all have the same number for a whole season. And, and that happened in Formula Two because Fred put it forward and, and got them to convince them that that was a very good idea. Uh, it seems crazy that they'd never done that before. So, so they could carry their numbers for a whole year. So he was thinking like that the whole time. Yeah. He, he, I just, one of the things about the guy that, that from that era that we, you've got to remember there was, we didn't have the mobile phones in those days or they didn't have them and they, they didn't have online booking systems via the internet. So you had, you had your, your airline tickets were paper. And Fred used to buy them in bulk from some Pakistani blokes in London who had the cheapest deals. And then he had in his suit briefcase bundles of tickets, but bundles of colored pens. And, and if they wanted to go somewhere, they'd turn up at the airport and they'd see which flight they wanted to be on. And then they'd modify the tickets using the pens because that's what the airlines used to do. And, and he'd, he could modify tickets with all these colored pens and they'd fly on these super cheap tickets all the time. And KK used to say that he traveled more miles in the air in one year than, than, <laughs> than the rest of his life because, because he was racing Formula Two in Europe and he was racing Formula Atlantic in North America then he raced in South America that year. He raced in Japan and he raced in New Zealand, all on these dodgy tickets that Fred had. <laughs> and you might have to fly halfway around the world to get to just where you needed to be because it was cheaper doing it that way than booking a normal ticket. Um, nowadays, of course, you just can't do anything like that. But, but that, that, those stories came to me from a number of people how he managed to maneuver his travel arrangements to get the best deals. Are there any other questions? You know, I keep telling stories all night. <laughs> Peter, that photo that you showed of um, Alan Jones and James Hunt, um, yeah. what year was that and, and where did you get it? Oh, that's a nasty thing to do to me. Um, Mark Spurl is the Spruel. It would have been, uh, given that he's got Jatans, it would have been in Canada at Trois Rivières. And that when those days they used to get the Formula One guys over. So you had Hunt, you had Jones, you had Villeneuve. So whatever year that was, they were racing mid 70s, roughly, perhaps 77, 78, something like that. Trois Rivières is, a, is a, a road circuit almost on the border of America in Canada. They still race there today, but not single seaters. They have other stuff there. And it was, Which, coast? Hmm? Which coast, if it's nearly on the border of the uh, US? Not smack in the, well, more east than middle, middle east. <laughs> so north, north of New York. Yep. Yeah. But not, not as high up as Montreal, if it's near the coast. No, it's, it's south of Montreal. Yeah. Okay. And it was a very big Formula Atlantic event. Um, a lot of the Formula One guys there, that's how Villeneuve became known because he blew them all off, including Hunt and Alan Jones. Alan Jones came second to Villeneuve that year. Okay. Yes. Any other questions? Um, it, I mean, we look back at all these eras of the 60s and 70s, sports car racing, tin top racing, Formula 2, Formula V, Formula 1. And it just seems to have completely disappeared and we just left with this mega show of Formula 1. It's, it's like it's all gone. I, it's a bit sad, really. And I just love listening to these old stories because there's so many characters and so many strange events that happen and just fantastic you've done the digging and and um, yeah brought it us brought it all back to us because um i don't think it'll ever be repeated no um, yeah. i was just going to say richard you should try watching the current formula 2 it's got a good aussies 
might win the championship this year. Yes, true. Yeah. Yes, very good driver. Sandy didn't so, even know it existed. Isn't that bad? Yeah, mate. Formula Two, Formula Three is still very massive. Hopefully, Jack Doohan, Mick Doohan's sons in Formula Three. Hopefully, you've got a picture of Thank you. screen currently. Can you see a Vicky? Can you see a photo there? Yep, that's right. This is this kind of underlines Richard's comment. These are the good old days. This was Bogota. And the guy on the left was Bobby Brown, who actually was, Bobby was a very good driver and, and a very close friend of Fred's for years afterwards. And Bobby had just run a race down there, won a race in Bogota in Colombia. They, they'd got Fred to, and he shipped a whole lot of cars down there for this race meeting. And Bobby Brown won it. That's Fred with the big smile and the hat in the middle. And that's the mayor of Bogota swigging the champagne. And what they found out after Bobby won was that one of his prizes was that any brothel he went to was free. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, today, that just wouldn't happen. But the other thing at that meeting was that Fred must have done a bit of a con trick. And he entered a number of different drivers. And depending what their name was, he, he made up their nationality. So he had one of the guys who was American and but he had a German name so he was entered as German and he had these different drivers of his under these names and one of the races that Bobby didn't win this German guy who, he's an American guy with a German won the race and the organizers are rushing around looking for a German national anthem to play and of course he, he wouldn't have recognized it anyway because he was from Arkansas or somewhere but that was the sort of thing Fred would do. You know, he would he would make up these things so that the organizers are very happy they had all these international drivers. And he'd shipped, I forget how many cars down for that meeting. Um, and he would have been paid by the organizers and then a number of the drivers would have been paying him as well. And they had a very good time, obviously. So are there any other questions? Let me see if I've got any other stories, if there are no other questions. Oh, what I didn't mention was, you would think a guy like this had to end up in F1. And he did, and it was a disaster. Um, he, he managed the ATS Formula One team for a while a very short while, like most of the managers of that team. Um, the guy that owned that team was Gunter Schmidt. And, and Gunter was notorious. Um, he was just an unbelievable character. But KK had said to Gunter, look, you need to get Fred running your team. Um, and just let him do it. He'll get good mechanics and the team will be fine. So that's what happened and Fred came in, but Gunter was impossible. And I, th I think he'd got, he went through, including Fred, five managers in two years, uh, including some other big name managers. And so Fred's time in Formula One was extremely short. Um, he was then lured back, he, he gave up and, um, he started importing performance cars, Porsches and things. And, 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 and out of the, he, he stepped out of motor racing. But then he got back into the sport when a, a young guy um, came to him and said, look, I, I want to run in Formula Atlantic and I want you to run the team. So Fred, agreed and they set up a team and they had a Rolt, they, well, a couple I think they'd bought. They had the right sort of money to run this operation and they were practicing, and I forget where the circuit was, and he lost control of the car and flipped it upside down and ended up in a, a ditch, a canal, and he drowned. Right? And, and Fred was just devastated. I mean, he said at the time nobody had even broken a finger, but that wasn't quite 
true, um, but he'd never had a fatality in his own cars before. And he was absolutely devastated by that. And the guy was actually Chandon, part of the Chand French Chandon family. Um, and so he'd had the money, obviously. And, um, and then Fred never, never got involved in motorsport again. He should probably have not gone back. What he did do was that by then, Nico Rosberg was go-karting. And he and Nico used to correspond all the time and he'd, and he'd talk to Nico on the phone. And he'd tell him to send his stuff to Ron Dennis and send this to there. And he was always encouraging Nico to help his career along. And in fact, he, so he was coaching him as much as he could. And then he would go to the Formula One races following Nico. And Nico that year, not 2016, was trying to beat Lewis Hamilton for the championship. And Fred checked himself out of hospital to go to the um, Hungarian Grand Prix and then the German Grand Prix, I think. And he didn't even make the Hungarian Grand Prix because he, he was in such bad shape. Another Australian, the doctor for the, one of the teams, for the Mercedes team, checked him back into hospital in Hungary. He checked out of there and he went to Germany. <laughs> and KK said to him, this is madness. You, there's no way you're going to the track. We can't get you permits anyway or tickets. And, and you stay here, you go back into hospital and then you fly home and get better. And then perhaps come to a race closer to the end of the year. So he stayed at the hospital, flew home and died four days later. Um, so it's, it was a sad sort of ending, but I think he knew. I think he knew he, was, he wasn't well and he would have been just as happy to die in the, in the pits than anywhere else, I guess. Um, just the sort of person he was. So that's the end of the story, eh? <laughs> um, on the cover of your book, what's the main car that you've you've got a photo of? Chevron, B thirty oh. whatever. I should know, but I don't. I was born in Bolton, where they make them. Ah, there we go. There you go. That was the other link, but I can't remember what number it is. It might be a B thirty four. Beautiful car. Yeah, it looks pretty spectacular. Yeah, that's KK's car, yeah. When, what happened was, um, Fred, had, Fred had run Brian Redman in a Formula 2 car against the Formula 5000s the year before in New Zealand. And I'd, I'd, I was doing a bit of writing there, and I'd gone along to the Grand Prix, I think it was, at Pukekohe. And at Pukekohe, there was a chicane on the back straight. I don't know how they got away with this, but somebody moved the cones away from there. And on the first lap, Redmond's in a Formula 2 car and the, he's kind of third or fourth behind the Formula 5000s. But he went straight through the chicane and came out leading the race, you see. <laughs> which was great fun. Um, and he led the race for a while, but then the 5000s gobbled him up. And I've got a feeling that Fred might have arranged for the cones to have been removed. Huh? Um, then the next year, the organizers said to Fred, well, why don't you bring back a couple of Formula Atlantics? So he signed up um, Kozata Witsky, which was a pain in the bum when you were a writer at that time, but because you had to write the name all the time. And Kozata Witsky was the current champion in um, Formula V, Super V, whatever, in, in, um, in Europe. So he was going to be the big name, supposedly. And he'd also had another driver who cancelled at the last minute. So Fred was there with two cars, one driver. So he rang KK, who'd done one race for him previously, and said, can you get some money together and come to New Zealand? And KK said, where's New Zealand? <laughs> because he'd never heard of the place. Um, and he managed to get enough money from Warsteiner, his sponsor, to pay for the airfare. And that was about it. And then after, so he flew over there. And 
Auckland was pretty quiet in those days and Auckland Airport was hardly a soul there. And KK came out of the area there and there's a T model Ford waiting for him to drive him to town. <laughs> and Fred had arranged this because New Zealand was very behind the times, but Fred had found this T model Ford and sent it to pick KK up and drive him back into Auckland. <laughs> And that was the sort of stuff they were up to the whole time. Of course, Rosberg went on and won that championship. And Kazarowitzki sadly went downhill from there. And his life after that was pretty bad. He got done for drug running and ended up in jail. Um, whereas KK came back the next year and won the championship again. And that, that sent him on his way, really. And the bond between the two of them was very, very close by then. But they obviously had a good time together too. Any other questions? One last story. Nobody asked when, me when this guy found time to get married. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Was he married, was he? Very briefly. <laughs> um, he, he had an eye for the ladies and um, he, he did have a girlfriend. They were never officially engaged. And um, Sherry was a, a nickname. And he'd, he's, they were at a race meeting, I forget where. And Fred's a Jewish, by the way, not a practicing Jewish person, but he's from a Jewish family. And they were at a race meeting. He was racing. So it was very early days, 1970, I think. And um, he said to her, if I win this race, I'll marry you. I think she'd been pestering him a bit. Anyway, the car broke down and, or whatever, and he pulled into the pits and she's in tears. He said, look, let's get married anyway, because he couldn't face the big marriage thing, you know, the big Jewish wedding. So he gets a phone book out and starts looking through the phone book. And he came across a, a rabbi who happened to be the rabbi when he was at college, who was now not too far away. So he and Sherry and one of the mechanics and his wife um, went to this town. I think they had a Pontiac, something special anyway. And, and Buzz Bodage was the mechanic, it was the rabbi. And he married them. There were just the four of them. The two witnesses were the mechanic and his wife, who was a nurse. And they left Buzz with the, with the Pontiac GTO or whatever it was. He thought that was great because he's a real character too. I managed to track him down. And that was their wedding. And, and then they told the family afterwards, they shot off to Europe for a week and then came back and told the family. But there was no way Fred was going to stay married. He was married to motorsport. And, um, and he and Sherry were married for five years. And, and the, their split, I think, was amicable from talking to Sherry. Um, and she went off and was a, she, she said she'd always wanted the white picket fence and kids. She never had any kids and she became a very successful businesswoman. Um, and later in life, they ran into each other um, four or five years before Fred died at a motorsport or a motor car thing that she happened to be at of dinner. And, and they had, in the last couple of three years of his life, they occasionally got together and had dinner, which was quite nice. Um, and she was very helpful to my story too. So he was married, but very briefly. <laughs> Enough what an interesting, yeah, such an interesting character, Peter. I, I'm, I'm, uh, for one, very pleased that this is someone that you chose to, to do some research on. Um, you know, he really epitomises that sort of era, doesn't he? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, well, not Australian, but very much a larrikin. Yeah. Uh, sounds like he uh, lived life to the full and uh, was out to, to make the most of whatever life, especially in the world of motorsport, had to offer. And the party went with it. That's right. <laughs> All right, last call for questions. I'll make one last comment then. Uh, one of the things that in doing this book that came out for me, 
because I interviewed an awful lot of Kiwi and Australian mechanics who'd worked for Fred and went on and done other things. And and some of I mean some of them were big names. Barry Green, the Australian who ran uh, the IndyCar team, won the Indianapolis 500 with the it's called he was sponsored by Cool, so they called it Cool Green. And Barry was very successful and he, he worked for Fred. So not only did Fred get drivers through, he, he trusted people who were good to do their job and they went on and became very successful. Dick Bennett's a Kiwi who's still running race teams in England today and has won five Formula Two championships, um, worked for Fred Opert. So I ended up with talking to these people and thinking, there's some great stories here. These people are just as interesting. So I've, I've been writing a series of articles for New Zealand magazines, obviously in that case, about Kiwi mechanics and where they are now and what they achieved. And um, so it, it, it became even more interesting as a result of um, interviewing these people. Well, I guess that should lead to a question to you, Peter. How long uh, has all of this research taken? It's obviously been something that you've been very passionate about, but have you dedicated a long amount of time to this? It took, it was two years from, from when I decided, when I'd spoken to Fred's sister and decided to write the story to when I felt that, that the book was finished. And then it was another, whatever it was, six or eight months before it was published. Um, but it was two years of, of interviews, research, writing, rewriting, um, to get to that stage where you could give it to the publisher and the publisher would accept it. Well, well done. It's uh, it's a great achievement. I think you should be very proud. And uh, yeah, we're very um, grateful for you to share it with us, Peter. So on okay. behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you may see on the screen now, uh, there's motorbookworld.com.au or veloci.co.uk. Uh, or Amazon are all sources for the book. Uh, so thanks very much again, Peter. Pleasure. Uh, now, uh, 